video about the history of the flows, the floods and the droughts on the Orange River. Well, the history of the past 85 years anyway. Now, I've been making videos of the Orange River and the floods it has over the last three years because I've found the stories and the history of the river and especially the floods interesting. I believe many people have discovered the interest in the river because of the flooding, but for some the interest goes beyond that. And viewers have been asking me a lot of questions in the comments on these videos. And whenever I didn't know the answer, I tried to look, at, to look it up and cover it in the following video. Questions like, how does this flood compare to other big floods of years gone by? And why doesn't the government build more dams to store the water? Uh, another question that I've been pondering myself is, what does this flooding of over two consecutive years mean, uh, our recent flood? And a popular thought is always that, has it happened before, is, or is this a sign of climate change? Well, to answer some of these questions uh, it can be difficult, but I, would, I thought I would dig a little bit into the history of the river and see if I could uh, get a clearer picture of what is happening. While digging, so much data came up that it was becoming overwhelming and to take the data and to turn it into information is uh, quite a job and then to take that information and turn it into an interesting video is something else again but let's try so this video is about the history of the water levels and floods of the orange river and the impact that the dams on the river had on those levels all of us know that the Orange River is fed by the two major rivers, the Waal River and the Upper Orange River. Those two rivers have a lot of other subsidiaries, uh, but we're going to concentrate on the Lower Orange River, which starts at Douglas, where the two major rivers combine to form, uh, to form the Lower Orange. I started by g gathering all the data on the river levels that I could find. Most of the data I gathered was, uh, is available on the website of the Department of Water Affairs. It takes a bit of digging to find the data, but once you work out how to get the station numbers and then download the flow measurements, as you can imagine, having daily measures for 85 years, that is a lot of data. So I had to do some work to get the data in a format that I can use in a video like this. The earliest data that I could get on flow rates on the Lower Orange was at Fuel's Drift. Fuel's Drift is far to the west, uh, nearer to the coast already. The flow of the river has been measured there almost continuously for the last 85 years. By using all the various measuring points on the river, uh, to fill in the gaps in the, that the other stations have in their data, we can get a good picture of the overall flow at the primary measuring point that I will be using for this video, which is Uppington. While Fjolsdruf started uh, measuring in 1937 and Uppington only in 1942, the measurements at Fjolsdruf seems to vary a lot in accuracy depending on the water level, and at very high levels, the measuring station seems to unable to get uh, good readings at all. Accuracy seemed to have improved after 1962 and seemed to be very good after 1980. Since the measurements at Uppington seems to correlate much more consistently with the measurements done at other stations on the river as well as at the dams, we will base the video on the measurements made at Uppington. I have mentioned that Uppington only started measuring in 1942. So I used the Fjolstrup data to fill in the early gaps in the Uppington data and other stations that started measuring in the recent years to correct the inaccurate measurements in the Fjolstrup readings in recent years. What you are looking at here is the average yearly volume of water that flowed down the Orange River past Uppington in the first column and in Fjol past Fjolstrup in the second column with the adjustments and corrections I have made, of course. Now, these are large numbers. For example, in a year with floods, the amount of water that flowed down the Orange and into the Atlantic Ocean can be more than 20 billion cubic meters of water. But absolute numbers are not so much what we are after. Uh, and it's going to be too hard for me to say them right every time anyway. 
What we want to understand is how it has changed over the years and how the years compare to each other. Are we getting more rains? Are we using more water? Should we be building more dams? The most frequent question is probably the question about whether we are seeing more floods now than in the past, or whether they are more severe or less severe. However, before we can use the flow data to look at, we first have to look at everything that has an impact on that data that has changed. Namely, the dams built in the river and the usage of water. It is a difficult one, but let's start with the water usage. Using the Uppington and Fjolsdruf measures, it should be a simple affair to subtract the Fjolsdruf measurement from the Uppington measurement. And the difference is your usage between Uppington and Fjolsdruf. In the early years, you can see how this does not look right with more water at Fjolsdruf than at Uppington. In other words, neg negative usage. Uh, this changes around 1961, with the measurements start, starting to make more sense. Uh, Fjordsdruf measurements also start to correlate better with other newer stations. So it seems that some calibration was done to the Fjordsdruf measuring station using the data from the newer stations to do that with. There is obviously also a time delay between the Uppington and Fjordsdruf stations with peak flows reaching the station at different times. But I tried to adjust for that as well as I could, uh, also knowing now approximately how long, long it takes for the change in flow to get from Uppington to Fjolls Drift. Looking at the numbers from 1983 onwards, you can see a st pattern starting to uh, emerge, highlighted in green here, with a calculated usage of about 0 0.7 billion cubic meters of water, or roughly about 30% of the available water that reaches Uppington is used between Uppington and Fjolstrup. In a year with high flow volume, the percentage of water used is lower due to, of course, to the higher volume of water available. The increase of water usage calculated here now correlates well with the growth of farming year by year until we reach a usage of around 1.2 billion cubic meters of water, almost double the 0.7, and this is about 62% of the available water in the river in uh, 2019. I've skipped over the flood years, first because the measurement seems to be less accurate during floods, and the usage is a low percentage compared to the available water in the flood year. Now let's look at the dams. Uh, the data that I compiled here is from various sources, Department of Water Affairs, uh, Wikipedia, and there are some websites dedicated to some of the dams like Van der Kloof. The Waal Dam was completed in 1938. Capacity, storage capacity that it uh, added to the total was just under 1 billion cubic meters. Then in 1952, the dam wall was raised by about six meters, and that added 1.1 billion cubic meters for a total storage capacity of 2.2. Blumhoff was built, was finished in 1970, adding another 1.3 billion, taking the total to 3.5 billion cubic meters. Garib Dam was finished in 1971, adding 5.3 billion cubic meters. Total storage volume, 8.8 .8 billion. Van der Kloof was built, uh, finished in 1977, adding 3.2, taking the total up to 12 billion. And the Waal Dam wall was raised in 1985 uh, in, in two, two parts of it. The one is storage added, 0 0.4 billion, and flood control capacity added with the flood gates of 0 0.6 billion. This adds to a total of 13 billion cubic meters of water storage. Now, this seems like a lot, and it is a lot. But just uh, as a, an interesting side note, let's just compare it to other big dams in the world, like, for instance, Aswan, which on its own stores 169 billion cubic meters. That's 13 times the combined volume of the four big dams we have. Kabora Basa is at 63 billion cubic meters, five times our total storage capacity. 
Now, if you look at the total storage of our dams at 13 billion cubic meters, uh, and you can look at the f flood year, the maximum, the total volume of flow in a flood year going down the lower orange of a more than 20 billion cubic meters, you can say, well, there's enough water, let's build another dam and store more water. But unfortunately, it can be a bit more complicated than that. For instance, the flow in 2021 was about 20 billion cubic meters, but that's below the dam. So you have to add the 13 billion cubic meters water stored in the dams. And so that gives you a total flow of 33 billion cubic meters. Then the flow for the nine years before 2021 was average only 2 billion cubic meters. But that does not mean 2 billion cubic meters has flown into the ocean. If you look at 2016, the total flow was around 1.6 billion for the year. And for a large part of 2016, there was insuff insufficient water in the river for the irrigation of the vineyards at Ausingir, the last of the big agricultural areas on the orange before it reaches the Atlantic. We therefore know that around 2 billion cubic meters is on the lower edge of flow needed in the river to sustain life on the lower orange. Saying that, we can say that anything more than 2 billion cubic meters can therefore be considered extra or excess water. Now, let us look at the excess of, uh, of available water that has changed over the last 85 years. I divided this table into roughly three par parts to make it easier I allowed some overlap of years between the first two parts. Here you have 1936 to 1966, with the Val Dam being the only one built. To allow a margin of error and uh, to aid in showing the numbers here visually, I've decided to mark anything over 5 billion cubic meters in green. In 25 of the first 30 years, there was excess of water, so it made sense to build the dams and store some of that water. Now, just because there was excess water in most of those years doesn't mean there were no droughts, but again, we'll get to that part later. Next up is the years from 1963 to 1992. Like I said, I used some overlap in 63 to 66 just to make the division easier. Most of our big dams were built, were built in this time period, and only 15 out of the 30 years had surplus water. Then if you look at the most recent 30 years, only 10 out of the 30 years had a surplus of water, with just enough water for co uh, continued periods of almost 10 years in between. Sure, you could build dam dams to try and catch the flood years. But building dams is expensive, and if the return on that cost will only be recuperated during uh, a drought after flood years, the economics of building the dam won't necessarily work out. There might not be enough excess water to justify the cost of the dam. I might be wrong in this regard, and it might st still be worthwhile building another dam, but r remember that the return on your investment is getting less and less, and it could quite possibly be, and I'm sure it is, going to be less expensive to improve our agricultural and irrigation practices to more efficiently use the water that we do have available. Now, let's go back for a moment to the first 30 years. I said that in this period, 1937 to 66, only five out of 30 years did not have a surplus of water. Does that mean that there were fewer droughts back then? Well, no. The dams made a huge impact. If you look at this table, you see the average daily flow of the river at Uppington for each month of every year. I used red to indicate drought. In other words, there's not enough flow of water at Uppington, never mind lower down the river. The orange is low level of flow, enough to keep everything going, but just enough. The green shows normal flow level where everyone has enough water. 
blue is high level, but not uh, threatening floods. And then the purple is flood level, the, the river breaking over its banks. If you look at it, for example, at 1937, you will see that there is a major flood level in February, and then absolutely no water from July to December of that same year. In 1938, the Val Dam was built. The impact of the dam was enough to reduce some of the red and turn them to orange. Though we don't have enough older data really to verify that, that is what it looks like to me. The doubling of the Val Dam's capacity in 1952 seemed to have made a difference as there are less droughts. But look near the bottom of this table where the three other major dams are completed and things start to look very differently. And then look at the next 40 years, and it's a completely different picture. No droughts, though in 2016 we got close. So the next question is then, what happened to the water? Dams don't consume water, they only store it. If we look at the maximum flow rates over the 85 years, we now see the peak heights of the floods. 1974 was the highest recorded with 1988 the second highest. Draw a trend line through it and it seems that the average maximum rates drop. But now look at the minimum flow rate. You can see that the average minimum rate has climbed as the dams allowed for more control of the floods and droughts. The total volume of flow seems to have dropped but again, is it raining less or where is the water going? I don't have enough data to work out exactly what changed, but I have enough data to get an idea. Earlier in the video, I said that the total flow and maximum flow doesn't necessarily correlate. See here, uh, in 1974, the, there was a much higher maximum flow rate than in 1976. But 1976 was uh, more volume of water because it, the river stayed high for much longer. To get back to the question about the two consecutive years of flood, you can see both in the graph showing the total volume of flow as well as in the graphs showing the maximum flow rate that you often had in the past two or three consecutive years with high flows both peak highs and total volumes high. And then you can see years of drought in between. So the dams have made a huge impact. In the past, you could have flood and drought in the same year. And then you could have long periods of drought, whereas these days we tend to have only long periods of reduced volume with the dam dams filling in the gaps in the rain seasons. So the Orange Vaal system is the lifeblood for a very large part of South Africa and the dams have had a huge impact on life along the rivers. Nowhere though has it had a bigger impact than on the lower orange. It is the area that is the last to get the lifeblood of the river when it dries out and it's also the area that gets the largest flood when all the subsidiaries have already made their contributions. Where the river runs through the harshest terrain of our country the green ribbon that cuts through the desert.